All right, the Hangout is live. Thank you for joining us for Dr. Makita Phillips, our first engineer for our Google Hangout series this semester. We're looking forward to having her here. Uh, she's just recently gotten her PhD in mechanical engineering from the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering uh, from North Carolina State University. Uh, her research interests are in the areas of finite element modeling of quench, i.e. thermal, behavior in high temperature superconductors through an intersection of electro, thermo, mechanical modeling, energy systems, and thermal management. So Dr. Phillips is going to give us a uh, seminar today on superconductors, hot or cold. So please take it away for us, Dr. Phillips. All right. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone in the room. Hello, everyone in, in cyberspace and abroad. Um, I'm honored to be able to talk to you all today a, little, a bit about myself as well as about the research that I have conducted throughout graduate school. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see it? Thumbs up? Thumbs up for the people in the room? All right, All right there we go. <laughs> Great. So when I flip, does it flip? Yes. Great. Okay. So I've entitled this uh, seminar, Superconductors, Cold versus Hot. Um, some people tend to know that superconductors thrive in a, in a cold environment. However, things have a tendency to want to be in equilibrium as in nature. So um, there are issues within the thermal spectrum. So I'm going to talk um, a bit about me. Um, some people call me Dr. P. I've and taught as a, a mentor in a camp, and they, my students call me Dr. P, so that's perfectly fine. I'm going to give the five W's and the H for superconductors and superconductivity. Talk a bit about my research as well um, as some closing thoughts. So, some about me. I'm actually a native of the D.C. metro area, specifically Southern Maryland. Um, I, I received my Ph.D. in mechanical engineering from North Carolina State University. I received my master's and bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Florida A&M University. I'm a mentor, bo both formally and informally. Um, I am the founder of the Minority Engineering Graduate Student Association, also known as MEGSA, at NC State. I currently serve as the National Leadership Institute Chair for the National Society of Black Engineers, which is also known as NSBE. This is my second term. And I'm also the first African-American woman to receive her PhD in mechanical engineering at North Carolina State. So these are all facts. These are all things that you can look up about me um, somewhere in Google, some kind of shape, form, or fashion. However, we want to look kind of into the intangibles, the things that, uh, that, I know, that you can't necessarily see from these facts to kind of, I guess, explain my journey. And so you have different points along your path. And I, what I call these, I call these game changers. And these are different points in my life where um, I may have had a direction change or I kind of firmed up the idea of things that I wanted to do. So I started elementary school. Not <laughs> 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 elementary. Um, Bulldogs. <laughs> so it was there um, that I was actually uh, enrolled into a TAG program. And what this program did, um, throughout the, the course of the year, different times, we would be pulled, certain students would be pulled out of class, and we were allowed to kind of think uh, creatively outside of the box. So it wasn't necessarily the instruction that was just in class, but we were able to kind of express ourselves in different ways. So moving from there, I went to Gwen Park Middle School. So Gwen Park Middle School was a site, well, not was, is a science and math middle school. And it was there that I was actually able to do my first engineering project. So what you're seeing a picture of, please do not laugh. This is great for middle school and my first, my first chance at using tools. Um, we actually had a project called Build a Tool. And through, the, through this project, you had to go through all the design phases of choosing which problem you wanted to solve, drafting, how you were going to solve this problem, whether you physically made something or not, and then the actual building stages. And so those are the things that I was able to do when I was in, I believe it was the eighth grade. 
And so what you're seeing is I kind of created like a bird spa. I don't know why I thought that birds needed spas, but hey, doesn't everyone? So that was my first stab at engineering. And what happened was one of my teachers actually told me that he thought that I would be great at being a mechanical engineer. So from then on, I said, well, I'm going to be a mechanical engineer. Mind you, I had no idea what a mechanical engineer did. I just knew that that was what I was going to go be because I enjoyed doing things like this so much. So it just made sense. I immediately latched on. So from there, I decided to test, take a test to attend a different high school um, outside of my neighborhood. And this was Oxon Hill High School. Go Clippers, yay! So Oxon Hill High School has a science and technology program. And through that program, I was able to kind of latch onto an engineering track. So not only did I take my, my normal high school courses, um, you know, English, and depending on where you are, the certain math levels, but I, I took an advanced level of courses, um, and I also was able to take different engineering courses. So I've built a, a bunch of different things, which I actually still have in my possession. However, I will not put those pictures up here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we were able to do, around that time, Robot Wars was really big. So we, we built robots, and we battled in class, um, made a maglev car. I actually took apart a gas engine and put it back together, and it had to run to get a grade. <laughs> um, so random things like this and drafting. So I was able to do these things in high school. And so going forward, mechanical engineering was for me. Even though I didn't know everything that a mechanical engineer did, I still enjoyed what I was doing. So from there, I decided to take the journey down to Florida. So I could attend Florida a and University, also known as FAMU, which is a historically black college. Well, sorry, historically black university. And we actually had a joint engineering school with Florida State. So I was able to have an experience where I had essentially two different universes where I was attending these classes in, in school and everything. And I think it made for a well-rounded experience to be able to see um, what engineering would be like um, as not only as a, a woman in that minority sense, but also as an African-American woman. So from there, um, you all were talking about lab. I've been there. Trust me, it does get better. I promise you. Um, so I won't say that labs won't be that long, but there'll be a different kind of formality. So it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Um, sophomore year, I remember thinking, I don't know if this is for me. Junior year, I remember thinking, um, I really don't think this is for me. However, at that point, you're already so far along in your coursework. To switch makes no sense and I had a four-year scholarship. So I had four years to come out with a degree. So I continued. I continued. I made it through. Senior year was fantastic. I love senior year. Um, so from there, I knew I wanted to go to graduate school. I knew that I wanted to get my master's. I wasn't sure about the PhD route, but I knew a master's was for me especially because of all the experiences I had doing undergrad. So I was able to do an internship at various, uh, various places throughout undergrad. Worked at NASA, um, worked at Ford. Where else have I worked? I feel like I'm missing one. <laughs> I might be missing one. But I worked at a different, different places, and what I was able to see was the people that were making decisions, the people that were ahead, and that were in management, and that also had offices, because if you know what a cubicle is like, you understand. But those that also had offices had advanced degrees. So a master's was for me. So I started again. I stayed at Florida a and and I continued on with my master's. And this is where I got introduced to superconductivity. I had no prior knowledge um, when I came in. I just thought it sounded really interesting, so I agreed to sign on to, to be a part of the project. So then fast forward about a year or so. I went to my first NSBE National Convention, and this just happened to be in Orlando. And I went to a workshop, or no, it was a luncheon. I went to a luncheon where I was kind of getting a picture of the scope of women in engineering and minorities in, in engineering. And the, the numbers were, they weren't, they weren't painting a great picture. 
And so it was there I decided, I kind of got bit by the bug to, to go forward and do my PhD. And at the time, I believe it was 0.02% maybe of women. or it was, it was really, really low. And so I went forward. I said, okay, I'm going to do the PhD. And then I, a couple, uh, another year later, I actually defended my master's thesis. So I was still on the fence. And then my committee said, we think you should do a PhD. So these were men that I respected and that I, I valued their opinions. So I thought about it, and then I actually really decided this time that I was going to go forward and do my PhD. So transitioned from Florida a and and I attended North Carolina State University. Go Pack! <laughs> and it was there that I was able to... Uh, kind of tighten my skills um, as a computationalist. So I, the, the nature of grad school in itself is, is more of independent study. So you're kind of given things, but it's, it's up to you to take it and make it your own. And so this was a time where I was able to not only take and make my research my own, but also learn the system of the university that I was at so that I would be able to complete things um, in an efficient way. So it's not just necessarily the academic aspects of it, but it's how you how you thrive socially and how you make that environment work for you. Um, because not only I didn't have any fam um, family in Florida, and I also had no family in Raleigh, so it was kind of taking making your own environment so that you can succeed. And so then moving from there, um, this summer I actually had the opportunity. To to be a SEEK mentor. And SEEK is a camp, a three-week camp for students um, that allows them to kind of experience engineering. It's a free camp. It's um, sponsored by the National Society of Black Engineers and various um, other companies and different things um, in cities around the country. And so I was able to teach um, different high schoolers. And so from there, I they may have learned a lot from me, but I feel like I learned a lot from them and that I was able to kind of pass along some of the knowledge that I've gained and kind of give them a, a snapshot of what it's like to, to come into the engineering world. And so not only did we do projects, but we kind of got that other aspect of connecting on a one-to-one -one level, which is why you're not necessarily a teacher, but you're, it's called seek, you're a mentor more than just a teacher. So those are game changers for me. So from there, let, let's get into the, the superconductivity part of it. And this is the introduction. There's a lot of information. Um, I did not want to scare anyone, um, but I want you to understand uh, the, the realm. This is, these are kind of the things that I would like to have seen when I first started with my master's program. So most people have seen this floating magnet image where you see this disk or something and you see the magnet floating over top. So that's part of the superconductivity world and that's attributed from the Meissner effect which I'll talk a bit more, a bit more about later. But there's also another part, um, meaning that when superconductors are cooled below a certain temperature, they lose their resistivity. And um, this is, these two together form kind of the basis of what superconductors are once they fit into these two areas. So I'm going to give you the who and the when, it's kind of like the timeline of who found what, when did they find it, and all those different things. So the first part is that zero resistance that I mentioned. And that began, that was um, discovered in 1911 by a physicist. <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> um, and what he actually was trying to find, he was trying to measure the electrical conductivity at low temperatures. It just so happened every time he was trying to find it, there wasn't any, just for mercury, for mercury itself. But the only way that he was able to do this was because... Um, in 1908, they actually, he was actually able to liquefy helium. So that discovery led to the discovery of superman. And so moving to the Meissner effect, which actually shows what that floating magnet that I just, um, actually causes that floating magnet that I just showed previously. Meissner and Ochsenfeld actually found that 
when you have a superconducting material, so say we start with the image on the left, um, where the temperature is higher than, I'm just going to say, critical temperature, and you have a magnetic field flowing through it, once you cool that, um, that, that material below its critical temperature, you now expel this magnetic field. So the fact that that's able to flow is because you have a magnetic field flowing around that superconducting material, which allows that magnet, that magnet to float. So then moving forward, you have the um, Landau-Ginsberg theory, or Ginsberg-Landau theory, um, which was found in 1950. And it kind of describes the macroscopic behavior of superconductors um, kind of combining or comparing it to other theories that were out at the time. However, then moving forward to 1957, you have BCS theory, which is Bardeen, Cooper, and Schiffield theory, also known as BCS. And this actually looks at more of the microscopic scale, looks at electron pairing to actually um, explain why, why superconductors behave the way they do. So these are kind of more of the four, these are some of the, the four basic things. The, the top two are really the main ones, but all four of these kind of roll in together. So how do superconductors work? So I mentioned critical temperature. The critical values are a part of what determines if a superconductor will be super or normal. Get it? Super, normal? Get it? Okay. Um, so what you have here in this image is a superconducting stability dome. The best way to look at this is below this surface, it's superconducting, and above it, it's normal, where you have it bound by the, the temperature, the current density, and the magnetic field. So each material has its own separate different values. Um, it just depends on which one you're looking at. But the, the best the thing to understand is that these are interdependent. They they work together. Now the the temperature is the critical temperature is more of a I would say a driving force, and you'll see more about why that is later. But they definitely work hand in hand to ensure that a superconductor remains superconducting. A tale of two superconductors, not two cities. <laughs> so you you have two different types. Uh, well, actually, you have a few types. But we're right now we're going to go between type one and type two. So type one superconductors typically have one element, as you can see um, in the chart. Um, however, they have a low critical temperature, which is super low. <laughs> um, which presents a problem because remember I mentioned that in order to be superconducting they have to remain below this critical temperature. Well it's very difficult to cool to this level um, for some of these to actually get the amount of current out that you would need in order for it to be effective. So moving to type 2. So if you can see around 1911 when superconductors were first found so at 4.2K is where you have liquid helium, which is what is used to cool around those ranges. Um, but also you move to type 2 uh, superconductors, which have a higher TC. And type 2 superconductors um, tend to have more elements. So moving on to the, you see the niobium, cal this, oh, niobium nitride, vanadium, silicon, and so forth and moving forward. Um, so it, in order for for technical applications and things of that nature, you, you use type 2 superconductors. No one really uses a type 1 superconductor. That was just kind of the starting point. So now I mentioned the type 1 and type 2 um, as a temperature distinction, but this is more on the, the critical field side. So for type 1 superconductors, it's either in a superconducting state or it's in a normal state. Um, there is no in-between. However, type 2 superconductors have three states. They have a superconducting state um, where you have the AC, HC1 as the, the boundary for that. And then in between HC1 and HC2, you have a mixed state. And at this point, you're actually allowing... Um, some of the magnetic field into the actual superconductor. However, it's still able to function and operate as a superconductor 
with these these magnetic flux lines um, present in the superconductor. And then outside of HC2, um, when the, the field is higher, it's in a normal state. And it's worth noting that the, these images are not to scale, but typically the, the HC2 is much, 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 much higher than HC1 and HC, which is another reason why type 2 superconductors are more desirable. So I mentioned those flux lines, and this is what actually is happening in this mixed state. So this blue image is a superconductor, and these little red dots um, would be equal to those magnetic flux lines. So the higher, the closer you get to HC2, um, the more flux lines, the more of these red dots would appear in this superconductor. And it's worth noting that each of these um, has the each of these has the, uh, the amount of magnetic flux as HC2. It just gets to a point where it overpowers and it's not enough room, and then you now have to switch to normal. So if you can kind of, it's, it's kind of difficult to see. I tried to curve it as much as I could. But um, these flux lines, um, this blown up flux line you see where the, the core is, itself is normal, um, the, the actual field is a, is a function of the radius of these flux lines. And what you have on the outside um, is, a, is a shielding current. And so you have two different types of current. You have a shielding current, which encircles this vortex flux line. And then you have a transport current, which is separate. So you can kind of see it better here. So that's the type one again, where you have the, if you're using your right hand rule, you have the current flowing out of the superconductor and the, the magnetic field encircles it. So with these, uh, the different, this superconductor for the type two, where you have the current flowing out of it, you have that, that magnetic field that's flowing through these, through these flux lines. Through the, imagine these circles are those red circles that we saw previously. And then you have a, a shielding current that's encircling each of those lines. And so you have a higher uh, critical current in type two, and that's directly related to that that mixed state. But but that's the easy answer. Um, <laughs> that's the easy answer for that. So we we already know. Okay, type two is where it's at. Those are the kind of superconductors we want. This is what we want to look at. So moving from there, you actually have two different types. So this refers to that, that critical temperature. You have low temperature and high temperature. So low temperature, or LTS, uh, superconductors, um, were discovered before 1986. They have a critical temperature less than or equal to 10 K, and they are cooled using that liquid heat. So if I go back here, um, you can see kind of where the transition between low temperature and high temperature um, sit around the niobium line. Is the, those are where we consider uh, low temperature. And then high temperature superconductors, or HTS, have a TC that's a greater than or equal to 30K. Um, they have cheaper cooling requirements because, as I mentioned, um, things in nature tend to want to be equilibrium and temperature falls into that. Um, and they also have high current densities. So we have a spike uh, right around uh, 19, it's, it's really around 1987. So what happened was um, prior to that, most of the, none of the, the superconductors had oxides. So right around 1987, someone decided, uh, this is actually an IBM, um, they actually decided to include an oxide into the structure, and then from there we saw the, the critical temperature take off, allowing us to use actually liquid nitrogen. So some of the more popular ones, and I'm actually missing one from here, which is MGB2 or magnesium diboride, um, which kind of sits in its own plane. Um, some people categorize it differently. Um, but LTS, niobium tie, and niobium tin. Um, and for HTS, 
uh, yttrium barium copper oxide, or YBCO for short, or bithium strontium calcium copper oxide. Um, you have two different chemical compounds there. So one is, is BISO for short, and then one is B2212, which is that first one with the 80 to 90K critical temperature. And then you have B2223, which is the 110 critical temperature. And each has some merits um, about why people use them. But those are, those, just keep those names in your mind. Keep those names in your mind. So how do we cool these? So I, I mentioned the, the cryogens before. So immersion is a way to, to cool them, meaning you would have a doer and you would fill it with liquid nitrogen or liquid helium. Um, and you actually put your sample in the doer and then conduct uh, your test or operate however, whatever you're trying to do. Um, liquid nitrogen has a boiling um, temperature of 77K, liquid helium at that 4.2K range that I mentioned before. Or you can do a conduction cool method which uses what is called a cryocooler. Um, so actually looking <clears throat> at the, the image. It's difficult to see, but all the connectors and everything at the top, um, that is where your superconducting coil sits. And it's a cold head. And then it actually sits and it's vacuum pumped down, and then it actually uses the cold head to cool the, the superconductor. So why do we care? I just told you all these nice things about superconductors, but what do we use them for? What, what are their purposes? Well, they actually have a lot of purposes, um, from electrical power components to medical, electronics, transportation, energy, um, just to name a few. And this list is not exhaustive. <laughs> but um, in the electric component range, you actually have fault current limiters. Um, if for those that aren't familiar, a fault current limiter is used um, in the event of a fault within your power grid. And what happens when you have this fault, you push the surge of current. Um, I'm not sure if anyone remembers, but there was this huge blackout in New York, in that whole area, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago at this point. Um, but that, that comes from surges of too much current in the, in the system and you blow everything. So the point of a fault current limiter is to divert some of that current and take it away from the system so that you don't have a blackout unlike before. And um, what a superconducting fault current limiter can do, it actually, be because of its amount, its capacity for current, it can accept a higher amount than the traditional traditional ones. And for this, um, the, HTM, the HTS used um, our B2212 and the, and the B223, so the BISCOs. Um, kind of fall into the salt, the um, S F C L range. And that's just the image I'll give you some time to kind of absorb the image. <laughs> it's a lot. So, so what is happening there? What what are those those things on the top and that pancake looking thing in the middle there? So that pancake looking thing, that's actually a coil, um, and you can make a few different superconducting coils in, in different shapes. But that's that's the coil. And so what's happening, you see those different, the they kind of look like spark plugs a little bit. But yeah. those are your um, those are your power lead in and lead out. So meaning the current would come in and out through those those um, different spikes at the top. Mm -hmm. And then it's a, the superconducting coil is actually surrounded by a cryostat. Okay. Um to, to to keep it cool of course. And then you have insulators between if, might be a little, a little bit hard to see, but insulators between those lead-ins to to um to kind of heat sink the top of it so that you're not overloading um, the amount of current that's coming and actually causing joule heating. You don't want to pass that on to your superconducting coil. Okay. So another part is power transmission. So I I showed that image with the. Um, so what you see on the left are copper, just copper transmission lines. And then on the right, those are actual um, coated superconductors. So keeping that image in mind, um, superconductors can carry at least 150 times more current than copper can. And those are the, the types of transmission lines that we currently have. 
So what this image is, is an image of a, a, a substation, a power substation actually in New York. And this is a, the Holbrook project that's in Long Island. And this is actually one of the first to actually implement these power transmission lines using superconductors. So they have to be cooled um, in order to operate. That's why they're not everywhere. But this is the first step in actually moving towards um, updating our the electrical grid and our system within this country that we know is definitely aging. Um, and we're expecting, which is why we have these these blackouts and we have these these issues. So actually moving into looking at how to update our systems. And the HTS using this are BISCO, so it didn't specify whether it was 2212 or 2223. But definitely look up Holbrook Project if you're interested. And then from there, so MRI devices, I don't know if anyone's had an MRI, but if you have, it's, it's this machine that you would either put a body part in or put your entire self in to actually take images to understand what's going on with you medically. There is a strong magnet within this system, so when you actually go through, when you put your body through, through the, uh, through the magnet, the magnet is surrounding you. To, um, to put a field on you to actually take these measurements. So fields can go between a uh, 1 to 2 Tesla. Um, you don't need much more than that. Um, and the magnets in these operate in persistent mode. What that means is you charge this magnet, then you unplug the power, and it will continue to work and continue to have a stable field. Um, this can, depending on how much you charge or the size, it can last for days or months um, without you having to continue to power it. And typically, LTS are, are used for this system. So I want to show you a video. Let's see if I can do this smoothly. Did it come back? Ah, great. <laughs> Everyone's so attentive. I love it. <laughs> Okay, did my screen go away? Ah, there we go. Screen share. Ah. So this is what you don't want to happen. Ah. Mm. There we go. <laughs> so what you actually have, they managed to get this chair stuck in the MRI machine. Yeah. And it's a little bit fun to see, but they're actually having to pry it off of the machine due to the strength of the magnet. <laughs> so that's one of my favorite videos. Um, <laughs> Wow. So when I mentioned the one to two Tesla, um, it energy drives the planet. Oh, it also drives these three inventors. You'll meet a man who makes objects float in the air, a guy who levitates UFOs in his basement, and a Okay, there we go. There we go. <laughs> so apparently, we'll meet a man who you know floats magnets in his basement. But <laughs> I mentioned the one to two Tesla, and it's 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 strong enough that it's the amount of force that they had to have to take the chair off yeah. of the machine. And, <laughs> and, and thinking about that, that, that's one of the reasons you don't have metal objects or magnetic objects in the room with your MRI machine. I'm um, just off the pure strength of, the, of what could happen as you saw with the chair and the MRI. And there are plenty more things, because if when people want to destroy one, when it's time to decommission it and destroy them, they chuck everything in there, like staplers, clip, or they just chuck stuff in just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> if you just look up videos on decommissioning, <laughs> if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the PowerPoint. So, not only MRI devices, but also in electronics. So a squid is a superconducting quantum interference device. That is a fancy way of saying it can detect magnetic signatures. 
Um, and one of the things that this can be used for is for mine sweeping. So when on our actual, on some of our our naval submarines and different things like that, and, and ships and things, they do mine sweeping. And so this is one of the things that could be used in order to do that. But also in quantum computing, which is essentially a, a higher form of computing. So this is not my area. Um, but I know that they do use, you can use superconductors in quantum computing. And most have heard of maglev trains or magnetic levitation vehicles. And what these are, are, and it's, it's kind of, you can kind of see it in this picture. So what you have on the bottom of the train, you actually have magnets. And then the track is the part that is superconducting. And so there is no motor. But the way the train propels is through pulsing um, between uh, of the of the superconducting track itself, and this is kind of this idea. If you've heard about the the, the push for the trying to develop high speed rail in our country, um, this this particular train is actually in Shanghai, and it can get to speeds up of about 311 miles per hour. Um, which is is really fast compared to traditional. And hold on one moment. <laughs> Go. Okay, no video for this one. But they actually have one um, in Japan and China. And the U.S., as I mentioned, it's been talks of trying to build one, of, I believe, along the eastern corridor. But I know in, in New York, specifically in the, the northeastern sector, that they're, they're talking about developing one. Um, from New York, um, they didn't. I don't remember the actual death, the the ending point, but there have been talks to bring high speed rails to the U.S. However, one of the issues or one of the things to push back is worried about the actual eff effects on the body, just be due to the high the high magnetic fields that are present in these in these trains. So that's one of the things that you'll you'll typically hear when discussing high speed rail in the U.S. Yay, physics! Woo! <laughs> so magnets are, um, or superconductors, magnets are actually used also in high energy physics research. So this is a picture of the the Tevatron at Fermilab. Um, it actually has been um, decommissioned at this time. They uh -huh. they just they just maybe three two months ago. Um, they just um, shut it down. But they do other um, high energy physics work at Fermi Lab where they, they, they use um, superconducting magnets. But also the LHC or the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, more famously, um, they actually use um, magnets, the superconducting magnets to direct the particle beams and actually at different juncture points. And another method is using magnetic energy storage. So you can store large amounts of energy within a superconducting magnet. And this could be, we, we would like this for, say, if you wanted to have a, a large amount of energy pulse in a very short amount of time. Um, that would be one of the uses of a SMES. Um, and it's also transportable. So say you decided um, you have a remote village or something that needs a type of electrical energy. Maybe you could charge up a SMES and then ship it over. <laughs> Those are just some of the thoughts. But that's what um, SMEs are designed for. And then also fusion energy. Fusion energy is, is it's, it's been around. It's, it's not new. But currently, with our CO2 emissions and different mandates and political um, interests, actually trying to reduce our CO2 emissions. And this is a form of clean energy. And this is kind of a, more of a push for that. And one of the things that's actually um, happening now is, is the EATER site. And I believe EATER stands for, of my memory, International Tokamak Energy Reactor. That's, uh, that sounds good. Let's go with that. If not, feel free to Google. But um, EATER is actually a cool, is a, is a tokamak that's being built in France. And it's a collaboration of different countries um, around the world. Um, in hopes that we can, if if you build this, if you build ITER, this fusion reactor, and it works, it actually 
duplicating that around the world so that we can reduce our, our world CO2 emissions and empower different things. And it's actually a picture of either. Hang on just a quick second. Could you, could you go and open your uh, Q&A? Oh, I have a question. You've got a question back on the uh, MRI. Okay. Slide. Uh, so Gerard is one of our students. He's not in the room, but he's watching online, I guess. Okay, and I see it. And Gerard, yes, they can operate for days without being recharged. <laughs> How does that work? Is it because of the, the low resistance in the uh, superconductor means you don't lose any energy in the heating? Exactly. So what happens is as long as it's um, as long as it's cool, it will continue to operate because there's no resistance. There's nothing to stop it. Okay. Um, they, it, there is loss, though. I mean, there's loss in any system. No system is perfect, which is why it may not last forever. But it, it lasts much longer than keeping having to keep something plugged up to power. Gotcha. Okay, sounds good. I'm glad you, I'm glad you reminded me about the Q and A. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we have any listeners that are on uh, YouTube, you can uh, either hop over to Google Plus and ask, ask the questions via the uh, Q and A app, or if you're on Twitter. Uh, tweet us at uh, GHO, uh, Google Hangout Seminar, and uh, with that hashtag, and uh, we'll find those, t those questions as well. Great, great. Cool. All right. Go ahead. All right. So this is Eater. Well, this is a proposed design for Eater. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that little person. Can you see that little person out at the bottom with the blue lab coat on? So that's the size um, of, of, of Eater. <laughs> so it would be very, very, very large. Um, I can't remember the exact amount that it's proposed to put out as far as energy related. But it's very, very interesting work, and they, they love to get questions and different things like that. So if, you, if you're interested in Eater, you can actually sign up to go do research there as well. So if you, is this something that you're interested in? I would definitely look into doing some undergraduate research. Um, you can go to France. <laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> so now let's get into what I've been doing. So this has been, I've been doing this the past, okay, since I got into grad school. Mm -hmm. um, this, this is the research that kind of kicked off my my introduction in, and this is the culmination of everything that I've done since I've been through my master's work to my doctoral work. It all, I, I stayed with the same, the same project or the same idea and I kept developing and, and increasing the, the different things that I did. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. And if you have any questions, just feel free to stop me. It's perfectly okay. Okay. <clears throat> So before I get into that, I want to kind of give you kind of a, a little bit of a background. So I talked about um, superconductors and how they have to remain cold in order to, to perform. Now, in, when they don't, one of the failure modes is, is called a quench. And what that means in the superconducting world is that you actually have this, this small area within within a, um, a superconductor that becomes normal. And then what happens from there, you have a hot spot. So you have this, this cold area surrounded, and then you have this hot spot. And that's considered your normal zone. Mm -hmm. And then the normal zone, in, in the interest of, I'll just say a tape superconductor, it'll propagate along that, the length of that tape. And the bad part about the quenching is that you actually destroy your superconductor. Is the picture here? Ah, here we go. This superconductor has been quenched. If you remember those silver, when I was comparing the copper and the, and the copper wire with the, the superconductor, remember how that was all nice and silver and, and color? Yeah. Um, this is what happens when you have a quench. <laughs> And the quench can happen a number of different ways. It, it could be a, a, 
a design flaw, a, a, I don't know, a, a force issue, improper cooling on different things, but, but quench does happen. So from there, so these are some of the, it's kind of the easier way to categorize it, between electrical, thermal, and structural um, issues. Make sure I don't have any other questions. Okay, great. And what you have in the electrical side, uh, you could have a transport current. Remember that current I said that actually flows through your conductor. It can hit a resistive spot, which could develop due to cracking or something of that nature. Um, but that would create joule heating, which would then create this, this, normal, this normal zone or this hot spot, which would lead to thermal runaway um, if not detected in time. Then from thermal side, you could have ineffective cooling, meaning it's you you have gaps in your cooling or your entire superconductor isn't penetrated enough that could lead to quenching. Um, you could have an increased thermal contact resistance, meaning when you have those, in order for the superconductor to operate, it's connected to current leads. And if you don't have correct cooling, then you could have some issues there with um, temperature, with, with thermal propagation from the current leads actually affecting the superconductor itself. Then on the structural side, um, the high compression can reduce that, that thermal contact resistance between the layers themselves and actually ensure uh, better cooling. Um, however, when you have small compressions between your turns, so you'll it's kind of difficult to see now, but once I show you the picture, then you'll have an aha moment. Um, but if, when you have um, ineffective compression, it can actually create delamination, or it can create cracking or some type of movement between your different layers. So now on to what I, I did. So I was looking at how insulation within a, a superconducting coil can actually affect that quench development and the propagation of that develop, the propagation of that quench. So I'm a computationalist. Um, everything I've done has been on a computer. So I use finite element modeling or FEM or FEA, same type of thing. Um, and actually looked at using the conventional insulator, which is currently used in multiple coils and different things in operation, and then also looking at using unconventional insulators, which are to get us to think outside of the box. An idea was if you now use an insulation that is thermally conducting but still um, electrically insulating or dielectric, then how would that affect how a quench um, manifests within the superconducting coil? So for just, this is this little diagram. So if you're looking at the superconducting configuration, I mentioned how a quench tends to propagate along the tape, which is the longitudinal direction. So wh what also happens in the transverse direction, which is that layer to layer um, direction? So ComSol is the, that's my software, that's where my heart is. Um, I've become quite fond of it over the years. Um, if you can hear the sarcasm in my voice. <laughs> <laughs> I actually looked at uh, the electrical and thermal behaviors. So it, was, it wasn't just the, how does it be, respond thermally, but because of the electrical properties of superconductors, you have to couple um, your actual reactions and how it operates to make sure that you're providing a an accurate picture because they're not they're not separated if I were to go into a lab they're one so I have to look at both of those so I had to learn um, I had to learn electrical ter terminology and how that will fall into the thermal side because I'm more of a thermal person so I had to kind of get out of a comfort zone to understand understand the different the different areas that electricity can play within my room. Hmm. So the model I developed was a five layer model and you'll you'll see what I meant by that. Um, surrounded by different homo by homogeneous layers. It was a five centimeter length, which in the world of in the physical world that's five centimeters is 
it's nothing. However, when you're modeling, it's a lot, um, and that be that comes from the nature of FEM itself. So for those that aren't aware, when you use finite element modeling, what you're doing, you actually have nodes, and the nodes um, are connected using different lines, which uh, form a mesh. And so the density of your mesh affects your accuracy of your results. The denser your mesh, the more accurate your results. So if you have a coarser mesh, then the, the actual output is not... You, you will get large error, a large amount of error. So you have to have this balance between having a mesh that's dense enough, but also to the point where it doesn't take you days to run a five centimeter model. And for my models, it took about, about 13 hours to run one, to run one. And you, you run multiple times because if, if you, so you don't, so that you can duplicate what you've been doing, but also to make sure that you're getting the, the correct response. So in this case, in order to initiate that quench, I used a heater um, that I actually input into the, the model itself and I operated at a 50K temperature. And I used a 70% JC. So what that means, the 70% JC, I was operating at a current, at a critical current density. I, sorry, I was using a an applied current that was 70% of the critical current value. Does that make that make sense? Yeah. Is that okay, good. Okay, no questions in the Q&A box. All right. <laughs> I actually looked at YBCO, which was one of the high temperature superconductors that I mentioned earlier. And this is because it, it, op it has a higher temperature, so the, the critical temperature for it is 92K. And it has a, a high JC for the high TC and also a high magnetic field, meaning that think of that superconducting dome that I showed you before. It's larger. So it can be smaller depending on whatever material you're using, but this one is a large one. And because of that, it has the most potential for growth um, for this all those different applications that I mentioned. And it comes in a tape form. So the Bisco can come in a wire, a round wire, um, but this is actually a tape. Similar to, uh, hmm. I want to say, if you were to have, I don't know if they still make those, like a fruit roll-up. <laughs> Have you talked about how you wind a fruit roll-up and you can see the layers? It's, it's like that. It's like that. If you were to chop off a section of a fruit roll-up, exactly like that. Hmm. And so I mentioned a pancake coil. Yes, it is called a pancake coil, and that is because it is flat like a pancake. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, in, in this diagram, this, this is... I mentioned the cryo cooler before. So this plate that I'm pointing to would be that, that cold head. So you would attach your coil to this cold head so it can be cooled. Um, but when you, ran, when you wind YBCO or, or any superconductor, when you're winding it, you wind it on a former. So in this case, it's a G10 former. G10 is the actual material that it's wound on. And then for, for the sake of moving forward, just to kind of give you a snapshot, the G10 former sits on the inside, and then you would have an insulation between the G10 former and your conductor. And then it would, forever, however many layers you have, however many you want to have, it would go on to infinity and beyond. Uh -huh. So that's a pancake coil. That's, that's kind of a, a, a snapshot of half of one. Now, is the, uh, the pancake coil like that, that current uh, dump? that you showed earlier that sort of looked like a little squat thing yes. with spark plugs coming out? Yes. yes. Okay, so this is a model for what what that would be. Yes, okay. that, can be, that can be a pancake coil, yes. Okay, gotcha. And then from there, there's multiple derivatives. There's racetrack coils, there's double pancake coils. It, it, it could go on, <laughs> but, but this is the, the basic 
to give you just an idea of what uh, a pancake oil looks like. Okay. So breaking that down even further, when you have a superconductor, you never just uh, you never just have it wound. It's it's called a conductor or a coated conductor, and that's because the superconductor itself is surrounded by additional layers to provide support. So in the case of YBCO, it's an oxide, so it's brittle. So you have to su surround it by different layers in order to increase the stability. So for this case, um, you have it's a it's a copper stabilizer that sits on the outside, and then if I'm going down, so the green the gr the green part that would be a silver layer, then the red would be a um, the YBCO itself. Then the blue would be a buffer layer, which um, serves as a, a boundary between the YBCO and the, the light blue grayish color is nickel. So the buffer layer is there to, to um, prevent against uh, chemical reactions between the YBCO and the, the nickel substrate. And then in this case you have another bottom inner layer and then you have another, another part of copper. So depending on the company, this can change. This can change. Um, this just happens to be one that was kind of used as a basis for my model, but different companies make their their formula is different, just depending on operation and trade secrets and things of that nature. So I mentioned that mesh before and how you have to how the density affects your accuracy. In this case, the layers are are really, really thin um, on the micron scale. And so you have these super long lengths, but your thickness is really, really thin. So that can, that can um, give you some issues when you're modeling as far as convergence. And by convergence, I mean making sure that your error is low. And you can, if, if if layers are too thin, you tend to have issues in the FEM world um, where your solution won't converge because it's having issues differentiating um, top the top of that thin layer from the bottom or just other things too. But for this case, because the YBCL layer is so thin compared to the copper and the nickel layer, um, it was modeled as a 2D layer. And this was previous work that was done um, in the group to actually find that you, you can reduce that the dimension and actually not sacrifice any of your accuracy. Hmm. So from there, so I mentioned those five layers. So here they are. <laughs> and you have the five different layers of conductor, and they're separated by insulation layers. What I mean by that. Though, if you look at the blowout, the blowout view, I mentioned that that red area, that, that would be your YBCO, so that's the 2D layer. And then you have the copper stabilizer above it, the nickel substrate, and then the copper stabilizer below the nickel substrate. Now, those inner layers, such as the silver and the buffer, surround the YBCO. However, they're not physically present. Um, this was because of their thin, their thin as well. So they didn't need to be present. But in order to account for them, you looked at um, different interfacial fluxes to essentially create the layer by using equations rather than physically having to mesh it. And you have two different sides of symmetry for, for this model. Just because of the behavior, it, it, it's kind of a halfway. If you think of a 5 centimeter length, so it, it's, it would be half of a 10 centimeter length. So this model is actually one fourth of a, 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 a 10 centimeter length of, of conductor. How thick is yeah. it? And how wide? You said how wide? Yeah, how thick is the layer in that little blowout region? And then how wide is it? Okay, the width is 1 e negative 4. The Thickness, uh, escaping me. I believe it's 0.5 e to negative 4. I oh, don't. it's really tiny. Yes, yeah, so yeah. So the, you tend to, and that's part of the reason, 
that you have to be careful how you model. Yeah. Just because of the thickness of it. <laughs> so it's like a tenth of a millimeter, right? Ten to the minus four meters. Mm -hmm. And then the other dimension was similar, right? It's a little bit smaller. Wow. And it has to operate. Wow. So it's really, it's really tiny. And even when you're looking, if, if I were to give you a piece of conductor, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like anything special. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to see any of these layers. Wow. <laughs> you wouldn't see any of it. Um, even if, if you spliced it, it would still be difficult to see it without a microscope. Wow. You, you can't see it without a microscope. So, so one of those little strips then, <laughs> how much, what would be the equivalent uh, copper wire or copper cable? Because that to me is just incredibly tiny. And I know that that's sort of the... the the, the cool factor for uh, superconductors is that you can, can you can carry a tremendous amount of current in a small area. But but what sort of is the conversion? Could you could you estimate for us what that small one is equivalent to? Hmm. So I can't, I can't convert the size. Okay. But, so I showed you that cable. Yeah. So if we take one of the cables, not the three parts of it. Okay. But for the same for the same size of, of copper compared yeah. to the same amount of superconductor. So if we were to have them the same size, the amount of current that the superconductor can carry is 150 times that of the that copper section. Okay. Okay. That helps to kind of get a sense of scale. Right. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. So from there, this is just kind of a schematic to understand what's going on. So if, if this whole full length was five centimeters, and then it's surrounded by these homogeneous sections, and you have this heater that's in the side. So this whole that whole boundary on the left side of the heater is symmetrical. So it's kind of half of your hot spot. Um, if you had all this, these are different locations that I use record temperature measurements, voltage taps, and different things to get the information that I need. And the computational world, it's great that we can do all these things on the computer. It's fantastic. However, your the accuracy is what matters. So one of the ways that I did it when I set everything up, I wanted to make sure that I could compare my results to stuff that was already done. So previously in our research group, someone had made a coil and they had these different tape measurement points. So I took those same points and then I also input the different material properties and some of the operation things into my model so that when I um, simulated it that I could compare it to make I'm getting something along the lines of what this person did. So which is fantastic. So if you can imagine this current is coming from your from your right from the right direction and flowing towards the hot spot. So, so keep keep that in mind. That in mind. So I mentioned the insulation materials. Uh, I actually looked at two different thicknesses, 200 microns and 100 microns. I'm sorry, 20 microns and 100 microns. And the reason for this was because the 20 we want to have the thinnest insulation possible, but still have it um, function just because of magnetic packing factors. So I mentioned how you smaller is better. So the more conductor we can get into a system um, means more current flow, faster current flow, um, higher magnetic fields if you need that. Um, so you, you want to account for that magnetic packing factor. So that's where the thin insulation came from, um, the 20 case. The 100, insulate, the 100 micron insulation came from the fact that that was something that was being used in different technologies. So one of the things you will do whenever you do research or anything, you do what's called a literature review, if you haven't already done that. This is for my, my undergraduate. Um, you will do a literature review, an in-depth one, and where you will actually look 
um, at what things have been done, what are the trends, what are the things that you've seen, and what are you trying to accomplish. So that's where the 100 micron thickness came from. And then for the, I looked at the 70% JC, I looked at Capron, which is the conventional one. Um, you can see it's, it's thermal conductivity. Um, as well as dope titania, which this material is actually developed based upon my master's thesis work. So once I finished my master's thesis, that information was used to submit a, um, a S, I believe, SPI. And then a comp my research group worked with the company to actually develop this material. And then from there, I went back and put that information back into my doctoral work. So it kind of came to the But I also looked at ideal alumina because of its high thermal conductivity in a non insulated case, meaning there's no insulation. So it's essentially copper on copper. So this thermal conductivity is what you can see for copper. And these are average values. So the different results, this is kind of just a smaller, I didn't, these aren't all the results, this is kind of the more, I guess the more important stuff. Wanted to look at that hot spot temperature. So we want to avoid what we saw in that quench picture. Um, if it's too hot, you not only use the stuff for superconductivity, but you can also melt, as we saw there, and burning. And if it's large enough, um, and you actually lose your superconductivity, what will happen is you have to expel this amount of energy somewhere, which can be, you can destroy an um, expensive magnet, or you have to expel this energy to where the point it could be dangerous. Um, so from there, the normal zone propagation velocity, or the NZPV, actually looks at how fast that normal zone grows. We want faster growth because that means faster detection, and when you're comparing low temperature superconductors with high temperature, you you see a the the order of the low temperature um, NZPV is is about it's about two orders higher than what you see for HTS. So we want faster growth so we can detect it faster. And then also something new was the the current sharing volume, and this current sharing is what happens when in, in normal operation, all the current will flow through all the conductors. However, when you have a quench, um, you'll have what happens is the current will divert to other layers. So for this case, I have the heater in the, the middle conductor. And what will happen when a quench starts, the current will divert to the conductor either above it or below it. But more often than not, it'll it'll you'll see the change faster in the conductor above it be just because of the, the geometry. Um, so the current sharing is a way to kind of, it's kind of a precursor, but it can give you a false positive because sometimes things can recover. But in this case, um, it depends on what kind of chances you want to take. So earlier detection, um, you have a higher chance of actually recovering so that you avoid the burned out photo that we saw before. So when looking at the high spot temperature, and there, this is, there's a line missing. Hmm. <laughs> um, there is a line missing, but <laughs> just due to the fact that I had a, a higher than normal um, transport current as well as the, the heater, the temperatures are slightly higher than what you what you would normally see, just so we can see a difference in. But you can see that the higher thermal conductivity is resulting in a lower temperature already. But so the, the dope titania and the cation, and actually the dope titania is the red line. <laughs> and the blue line is capton, the capton insulated coil. Um, but what you'll see is that the, the, higher, the higher your thermal conductivity, the lower your peak temperature, even after... You know, time has passed. And all of these simulations were conducted for two seconds. So two seconds does not mean two seconds real time. Two seconds in the time of these models means 13 hours in real time. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
but if that's two that's two seconds in the the propagation of the the the, the current in the the superconductor, but it's 13 hours of computational time to get that answer, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. So now is that two seconds enough time basically for, oh, detection that, oops, we've got a quench, we need to do something? Not necessarily. So I wouldn't use, I wouldn't use the two seconds as a, that's, that's not an indicator of detection time. Detection time is something totally different. Okay. And that's more dependent upon how much energy you have in your system, um, what your pressure point looks like. It, 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 it's more complicated to try to determine what your detection time would need to look like in order for you to avoid certain temperatures and things like that. It, it, it depends on your system and you can tailor it so whatever application you have or whatever superconductor you're using, that, that's more tailorable to determining what, as a magnet designer or a designer or something, what you would need to look at, what kind of scheme you would need to set up in order to accurately detect to avoid structure. Okay. So on to the normal zone propagation velocity. The x direction in this case, if you can see the sub it, it is the long to take, so that's the longitudinal direction. And there, because the quench uh, tends to develop along that direction anyway, you don't really see that big of a difference uh, in the values. But if you move on to the transverse direction, you now see that for ideal alumina, um, that it is nearly the same as its longitudinal direction, which is a good thing because, because that means that now if we're having this growth of this normal zone, we can either detect it earlier um, because it's, it's spilling to the different turns to the different layers or we're reducing the temperature because it's, all the, the thermal energy is not reduced to just a single conductor. So it's interesting to, to look at moving forward now how we consider insulating these coils. And then for the non-insulated cases, it's, it has a high uh, NDPV watt, sorry, NDPVY <laughs> as well. And this is because of its thermal conductivity. However, even though its thermal conductivity is much higher than the ideal case, um, one of the issues that it runs into is because there's no insulation between the different layers, it has uh, current sharing issues. So whereas the it may current share earlier than ideal case would. On to the fun stuff. So if you've seen the advertisements for this, um, this is, these are the images that you've been seeing. <laughs> and um, these are current sharing volumes. And what they are, the temperature, these are taken as the temperature where current sharing begins. And for this case, it just happens to be 62.6K. So that blue area is the 62.6K. And then the red area is 92K, which I mentioned is the critical temperature. So outside of that, um, what you can see for Kapton is you have more thermal energy in that center, central conductor. So if you think of this as that, that boundary, that left boundary being where the hot spot uh, initiates and then going to, along the X coordinate, it would be going along the length of, of the actual configuration itself. You see that it's, it's moving fast within that central area, which is with what happens. However, if you look at dope titanium, which has a higher thermal as well as alumina in the non solidity case, it tends to be more more distributed between the different layers, especially in the ideal alumina case. You can see that the temperature area is barely around the 90 range, um, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it does make an argument for that thermal connectivity piece. And then for, this is, I'm not going to show it for all of them, but this is kind of the breakdown. So I wanted to show a snapshot of the time periods. So that, that one we just saw was at the 0.4 second mark. Then we moved to the 1 second mark. 
and then onward to two seconds. So at that point, um, the temperature here doesn't actually show. And I'm sorry, these are for the five conditions. This does not include the the homogeneous section. This does not include that. Um, but you you see more of that when you have more of that propagation within the central conductor. It kind of it increases that temperature hotter. So what you're not seeing, you just see it's not okay. Which you don't see beyond that. I have other stuff that looks at that, but I didn't want to beat you over the head with information. Um, but it is possible um, to look at what those temperatures look like above that 92 K and see what's going on. And if you did that, what you would see, if, if I looked at these two now between comparing Dill Titania and Kapton at two seconds, they, they it's not a big difference, but you can see the shape difference. Um, but if you look at the temperature above 92, what you would see, the dope titanium would have a lower temperature than the cathode in that section. And that's important to know when thinking about construction. So, so what do we get from all this? The bottom line is high thermal conductivity is good when we're looking at our insulation materials. Um, but it's also to note that we don't want to just look at... Uh, Configure the coil configuration, um, the superconductor strength itself, but we also want to look at insulation as an overall part and, and something that could help mitigate these issues that occur with pitch. And it could possibly lead to, especially the current strain volume, it could lead to increasing the warning time so that you can save the coil in the event that it's quenching. So, so that's kind of the, the big idea and the point of, of all of this information. So the overall, everything. Um, I want you to take away that superconductors have zero resistance at cryogenic temperatures. Type 2 superconductors are the best for technical applications. Um, and it can depend between LTS and HTS, which is the your application. Um, but also, all the applications that I talked about, there are more applications that could actually, uh, that do use superconductors and the possible benefit from them. Future. Um, quench is bad. <laughs> High thermal conductivity insulation is good. <laughs> and superconductors are cool, and, and that's just not just because of the cryo. So that was my little joke. Feel free to laugh. Um, and from there, um, I just want to say thank you. Um, decipher some academies. And if you have any questions, feel free. And this is all of my contact information. All right, let's thank our speaker. So we've got another question uh, from Gerard on the uh, Q&A, so go ahead, if you, if you have that available, pull that up. Okay, I can see that. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so, so I'll, I'll say this question out loud. I don't know if anyone else can see it, but it says, in the last Google Hangout with Dr. Terry, we learned that the biggest problem with energy is energy storage. Why is this a problem while we have superconducting magnetic energy storage, and what are their disadvantages? Okay. One of the, I would say one of the biggest issues with, uh, super, with SMES, okay, SMES um, is, is not necessarily that it's not available, but it, overall adoption isn't a, isn't a huge thing, and that could be because of cost. Because superconductors cost more than, you know, just typical things that we've had for years and years. So you have to make the argument for, is it worth it for me to build this SMES system um, cost-wise for energy storage? How much does that cost? Um, would it be to our benefit? But also, I mentioned quench as one of, a, one of the failure modes, um, which is very possible for a SMES system. There are other failure modes um, that I didn't mention, but it, it kind of just depends on what you're trying to accomplish and who's who's funding it. <laughs> um, and if if you have the availability to do it, then you know by all means. But I would say those are some of the biggest things right now in my mind that that aren't that aren't making it widely available. And also the general public doesn't really know about superconductors and what that means. And some of the things that that I have to do in my community, I just had to give you all a background before I could even talk about 
you know, my research because a lot of people don't know what, what it means to be involved in this field. And so it's, it's some of it's also educating the public about what they means. And as, as science and engineers and everything, we have to make sure that we not only build these fantastic things, but we can actually explain what they do and that we don't frighten the public. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you have any questions here in the room? John, fire away. Um, you said you guys use doped titanium dioxide. Um, how exactly is it doped? Because I know that it can be kind of reactive under certain, certain, certain circumstances. I was wondering how that would work with electricity. Okay. So I can't tell you what it's doped with um, because it's a it's actual company secret. Okay. Um, so I couldn't tell you. That's the that's the short answer. <laughs> um, um, so I I actually learned later what it was dope with, but I've had this question before in the middle of a presentation, and, and everyone was like, <laughs> "So I wish I I wish I could, um, but I know that it's not reactive. I've actually seen it physically, um, and so." I didn't actually put it up here, but I'll probably put it on my site. There was a, a, a paper done that was experimental. It was experimental results actually using dope titania, um, titanium as, a, as an insulator. So it has been tested. So one of the things that I didn't talk about, I mentioned it, was comparing your work on the computational side to experimental work for accuracy. So I did that for the dope titania side. So it exists. <laughs> Any other questions? Why, uh, why do you settle on mechanical engineering as opposed to, say, nuclear, electrical, or something else? Because, hmm. I mean, it seems like if you're working with superconductors, that seems like around you know, electrical engineering. But, you know, well, so I, I guess a follow up question would be was it difficult to break in coming from a mechanical engineering background? Uh, no, I wouldn't say so because we all have to take that um, that intro to EE course. <laughs> I, I actually did quite well in it, but um, I don't think that I'm electrical engineering material. Um, and by that point, I like thermal things. <laughs> it, it just it clicked for me. So if you're not aware, mechanical engineering you have a lot of sectors. You have thermal. You have dynamics, you have material science, but depending on the school, it can be its own separate thing. But in my department, that's that's how it was broken down. Out of all those things, I did the best in thermal, and it made the most sense to me. <laughs> so mechanical engineering worked for me. And then moving on to graduate school, at the time, I didn't know what I was going to do research-wise. I just happened to apply, and I was presenting a project. And it made sense, but I didn't know the level of involvement on the electrical side. But once I, it's, it's kind of like anything. Once once you kind of figure out stuff, you just keep digging and you just keep digging and you learn more and you learn more about the culture and you learn more about the things that you need to know in order to succeed. It, it's really no different than that. So I was able to pick up on the electrical side and, and you'd be fine. I'm not fluent. <laughs> but I, I I understand enough that I that I can talk about what's going on. All right. Most of our students are um, we're all we don't have an engineering program here at our uh, university, and so our students are either pure physics majors or they're applied physics majors, or we also have some biophysics, and so. Uh, some of our graduates will go on to engineering programs, and so it's kind of interesting to see them then, you know, uh, succeed in those programs as well. Did you ever have a physics class, either in undergraduate or in graduate school, that then sort of you could see the other side there? And then what would you kind of recommend for physicists who are looking at maybe doing a master's in engineering? What advice might you give uh, these guys? Um. So I'll kind of start, I guess, with my physics uh, knowledge background. Um, I did physics, high school physics, as kind of my, my prereqs. 
-hmm. before I got into engineering. Um, and I actually, physics was not for me. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't for me kind of because it was almost like I wanted to see the other side of things. And I was thinking more big picture instead of derive this and that. And so it it wasn't <laughs> it it wasn't my thought process. Um, so what I would say for for transitioning over is to kind of think about the things you learn and the theories you learn and all the things that you've done and how you could apply that to us any system. Yeah. Any system. just figuring out how to kind of connect those dots because that's what's going to help you be successful if if you can translate anything. I just talked about the role. I, I just talked about the role. So if you're able to kind of make that that connection between all this theory and everything you learn um, to an application or anything that you do day to day, then I actually think you know you'll be okay. Because what happens in undergrad is just that's just your basic. That's just your you know your your training ground. The only I would say the different things that I may have done have have been projects actually physically having to make stuff maybe that might be more so the difference in, in just senior design and all that stuff. But um, once you have that, that foundation, you can kind of spin it, especially in a master's program. You can take the stuff you need to take to kind of to kind of help you out. Because I don't think I did too much physical stuff in my master's program. A lot of my stuff is theory. Mm -hmm. A lot of my stuff is theory based. I, I think you'll be fine. <laughs> we, we try to get our undergrads to do uh, undergraduate research projects so that it, it really forces them to, to take that theoretical book learning and apply it and really what I think makes the biggest connection to what, what you experience where you have to design a part, you have to think about an experiment, you have to design a circuit and then you go build it. And then you use that part, you use that circuit in whatever your research project is, and that's all part of the design and the um, the full experience. Uh, and so it's it's nice to see that that other side, as you said, the application of the theory. Right. I would definitely encourage undergraduate research. I wish that was something that I would have done, um, but I didn't know where I was going to go at that point. Um, but if you're slightly bit, if you're the slightest bit interested in grad school or anything of that nature, I say talk to the professor. If I don't think they need any help in their lab, uh, try to do some kind of research. I threw Eater out there. <laughs> they have physical Eater. Uh, go to France. Don't see it unless you come to France. Um, and there's other universities and everything that have different research opportunities to um, actually allow you. To, to come. I know that actually at NC State, there is a undergraduate research program where they bring in students from different universities um, for, I, I, can't, I can't remember how long in the summer, but it might be two months or so, mm -hmm. something like that, and they'll bring you in and you can work in someone's lab and you can kind of get to understand what all that means and you can, you might be able to get into engineering or something. I know my, my lab group, we had two um, are you student? Right. That was going to be my next question: is if uh, you guys there at your research group or at the university had are you uh, research programs? Because the due dates for those are coming up, and so we got to get our apps in. Yes, definitely, definitely apply. I'm not sure of the competitive nature of it, but I would say if if you if you have the opportunity to do it, if there's something that you you know you're not quite sure. You don't really know. Don't let grad school be the time you figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and you know apply and, and get in to get get it get your application even if you're not sure. Go ahead and do it. It's better to have the opportunity to reject it and say no, I decided no, rather right. than not have giving yourself the opportunity to get on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's just you know you get paid. You get to go to a campus where they're doing some amazing, cool work. You get to meet some amazing people. You know, it's a great summer to go do that. So take every opportunity. All right. Have any other questions you want to ask? Concerning, uh, let's see if we can get back to one more, one more other question. Um, 
concerning the production of the superconducting material itself versus the actual process we needed to keep it cool, where, where exactly do the costs kind of you know fall? Is it you know more expensive on the you know the cost of to keep something cool or to actually produce a superconductor? It depends. <laughs> um, if you have a low temperature superconductor, it can be more costly to cool. Um, it de and even though the materials from that, I think they might be cheaper. I think they might be cheaper, <laughs> actually. Um, but it it depends on how and also how much superconductor do you need? Um, how much? What type of system are you trying to make? If if you need a lot of it, of course your costs will increase. But I, I believe the LTS are cheaper, and HTS depending on the kind. It started um cheaper and it um I would say more widely accepted where the cost is being driven down. But if you can get a, a cheap AT HTS with the ability to use a cryo cooler, you're golden. But that's actually an interesting question. I like that one. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that, that is, was interesting to me when I was in grad school. I got to, to work a little bit with a couple engineers, and, and it was interesting to look at the other types of optimization problems that you guys think about. And it's not just, oh, I'm going to make you know the Carnot engine. What's the most efficient engine? You actually look at, well, what about maximizing power? What about putting dollar signs into the efficiency formula? And how do you do that? How do you design an engine that then kind of balances, all right, well, what's the cost per unit? And that was fascinating. And so it's cool to ask those kind of questions because you really get down to it, that's how it's going to be used or not. Right. How does it fit into the market? Right. Right. So, well, this has been fantastic. If we have any other questions, now's the time. We're good. Well, let's thank our speaker one more time. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. This has been fantastic. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions for us or if there's anything that you'd like to, uh, to know about us, just let me know. You've got my email address. And I really appreciate your time. And uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank All right. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Phillips. Have a great evening, guys. Right. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>